our September meeting. And uh, we'll start with a roll call, please. Jenny Chabek? Here. Phil Neese? Here. Tweed Schumann? Here. Stacy Hessel? Here. Chris Rusk? Gary Nathan? Here. Matt Dale? Here. Chris Vaselli? Martin Hansen? Ryan Carey? Here. Laura Rusk? Here. Cheryl Treeland? You have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, can I get certification of compliance with open meetings law? This meeting has been noticed to the public and news media as required by section 19.84 of the Wisconsin statutes. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead with public comments. Just as a reminder, um, comments will be limited to three minutes per individual. Comments should be directed to the committee as a whole and not directed to an individual committee member. The committee cannot respond to your comments during this time. And um, we have our sheets up here. We've got three, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with Linda Zilmer. Linda Zilmer, a resident of the village of Birchwood, but also an Edgewater property owner. Um, I, I think what makes uh, listening to the uh, committee and members of the public speak uh, interesting for me is that uh, there is common ground that I think needs to be found, um, not just looking at capacity or profits or things like that. The purpose of county government and zoning and public health, as I understand it, is to protect public health, safety, and welfare. Um, so in, in looking at providing regulations that do that, we need to protect groundwater. For me, water is important too, but it's not necessarily the water in the lakes. Most of us have shallow private wells and on smaller lots, it's all in close proximity to people's private on-site wastewater treatment systems. So the need to provide for protection of public health, safety, and welfare is also protecting the groundwater. And I think that's very relevant to the deliberations on septic sizing. Um, so my public comment is that I hope when you get to agenda item number 10, uh, that the residential sizing is what is chosen because I believe that's what most properties have been uh, sized for and does the best to protect groundwater. And I also have a concern with relying on the people who are the contractors are, who are doing the uh, work out on the properties. I became aware this summer that there is a property where there was a teardown of an old cabin. The old well was pulled but was not capped. The uh, land or the soil that had been over the old septic system was then spread over that well area. And um, what I think the original application for was for a holding tank, but now I believe the plumber is recommending that they do a, uh, a conventional septic system uh, to minimize the pumping by septic haulers because it is intended to be used as a TRH. I have a real concern if what should be maybe a, a holding tank system is now going to be a conventional system in consideration of it being a tourist rooming house. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Lisa Flachek. Um, I come from a long line of military family members, uh, including my offspring. And as I talk to them, uh, there's some military thinking approach that I thought might be useful. And one of their advice was define the mission. And it's not clear to me that the mission has clearly been defined. Uh, there were some complaints that came into the health department that somehow have uh, evolved into limiting septic size. The second thing that they pointed out was avoid mission creep. And to me, it's not clear that limiting septic size 
well resolve the complaints that were coming into the health department to start with. I can't find a straight line there. The third thing that they talked about was what's your collateral damage? And I think with the way that I see the committee going, the collateral damage is going to be significant. In our one bedroom property, if we are limited to two people per uh, booking, our bookings will probably go down 30%. I have a cleaning service that's a single, or is a, a married woman with two small children. She wasn't able to find a job in town that could accommodate her childcare needs. So she developed a cleaning service and she is now making a livable wage to help support her family. If I cut my income to her by 30% and we multiply that by 500 plus rooming houses, assuming that they all will be affected to some degree, just in the cleaning service business alone, there will be significant collateral damage to this community economically. So I urge the committee to think about what was the original mission and will limiting septic size really decrease the complaints that people have been calling about? Thank you. Mary Stibby. Hi, I'm Mary Stibby. I'm a full-time resident of Hayward. Um, I would agree that limiting septic size is, is not necessarily going to resolve all of the issues. Um, I think that one of the things is, is uh, um, in the information that I've seen, it, your septic size is listed as, or defined as to bedrooms. Um, I think it has to actually be uh, defined as the sleeping areas. Um, in the, the uh, TRH that is next to us in an adjoining uh, property, it actually, um, the septic system was sized for two bedrooms. They have three different areas uh, for sleeping. And we have seen uh, the, the number of tenants actually exceed what it's even listed for um, on Airbnb. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that the at the last meeting, the natural resources were, you know, you were concerned with the lakes. And I think that's very important. However, what we're really struggling with is that we have, uh, there's tenants over there that are leaving fires um, under, unattended. Um, and even though we've complained to the owner, it actually, there's been no action. Uh, we had we had tenants last week that um, not only did they leave it unattended, but one day seemed to entertain themselves by shooting the fire with uh, lighter fluid. And I've not been able to open my windows all summer. Um, certainly the night that they shot the fire with lighter fluid just to see the flames. Uh, uh, the home was, you know, all we could smell was lighter fluid. So, you know, I think um, I was asking what, what this document was um, as far as tourist rooming house, um, whether this is actually a, a, um, an ordinance. Um, and I understand that that wasn't actually uh, put into effect, but many of the issues that we are seeing would have been addressed with this ordinance and, and perhaps give us an avenue um, to log our complaints and resolve the issue. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, um, what's being labeled as a super host uh, for these Airbnbs or, or any of the rentals, um, they have two obligations. They have an obligation to the neighbors as well as to the tenants. And if they, uh, satisfied the obligation to the neighbors, we probably wouldn't have these conversations. So I think you really need to look at what is the recourse for the neighboring properties. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody online that wishes to speak? If anyone's online that wishes to speak, please raise the hand button. Sorry, what was that? There's one hand up now, 
Go ahead, Brittany. Okay, so I don't really have much new to say. I think I've said, you know, kind of what I wanted to say in the last two meetings. Um, however, I wanted to just address the fact that, you know, as hosts, we do want to see good regulations put in place. Again, just wanted to reiterate that we are interested in protecting our neighbors' rights um, as well as our own. We're are, we are interested in protecting the groundwater and the lakes. Um, we want to work cooperatively with, you know, the county officials that are in place and the rules that are in place. But we don't feel like that's being reciprocated. We don't feel like our neighbors are coming to us and saying, hey, somebody's shooting lighter fluid into the flames. And and granted, it sounds like um, the speaker did did do that. But for a lot of us, the complaints aren't coming to us. Um, they're coming to committees like these. They're getting called into Matt McKay. Um, they may or may not come back to us, and we may or not may not have an opportunity to address them. Um, so, place like, some guidelines for what happens when a complaint comes in. How do we um, verify that one? It's what ha is being complained about is actually happening, because, for example, if a dog is barking in my neighborhood and I get blamed for it but it's two houses down because the lake is, the noise is coming through the lake. You know, that's a serious matter. Like, I don't want to get a flag on my license for something that's happening two doors down. And I also want to know about it so that I can address it with my guests. But that's, there's no procedures in place right now. It doesn't sound like for uh, reporting back and forth and working with us. Um, so that's my major concern. Going back to the original, um, purpose of this committee to address some of these issues, I think there's a lot simpler ways to do it. Um, and yes, it might might require the county to have some more manpower. Um, Matt is alone in a job that is very large for 500 rentals. Um, so I don't know if that's been looked at, but I feel like it does need to be looked at um, because he needs support and we need to be able to have a good relationship, a working relationship to have good relationships with our neighborhoods and our communities. Thank you. Could, could I get Brittany's last name for the minutes, please? Brittany. Was, thank you. Did you get it? You didn't get it. Could you spell it? Whoops. Girdle. Spell it. C-R-A-T-A-L. Okay. I just got kicked out, by the way. So what? my my internet's not stable, and it kicked me out. That's why the share screen's not up anymore. Okay. Uh -uh. I spinning wheel of death right now. So. Okay, um, while Jay's working on that, the next thing is the approval for the minutes of the previous meeting. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? We have a motion and a second. I do have motion one to change to the minutes. Um, my my uh, presence, the meeting was not noted. It was it indicated I was absent. I was present. I think I was in the waiting room, stuck in the waiting room in the Zoom um, when roll call was taken, but I was present. Is that Ryan Carey? It's Ryan Carey. Yep. Would that change? The motion was by Phil, second by Laura and Cheryl. But we have one change. So is the motion to approve with, with the change? The change yes. And second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Um, so is uh, is Rebecca on the line? She is? Okay. We wanted to get an update. We, we talked last time about having a regular update in this meeting on the status of the um, Wisconsin Counties Association working on a state model ordinance for regulation of TRHs. Um, Rebecca, do you have an update for us? Yeah, so um, Dan Barr from WCA, uh, I had talked with him um, a few times about joining the meeting today. He was not able to join. In fact, I 
I talked to him just before the meeting um, and he was not able to attend. However, he is, uh, we're slated in, and I think we're gonna talk about meeting dates for October um, to come and actually you know, have a discussion with the committee. Now, that being said, um, there has been a lot of discussion at WCA about the model ordinance at our um, annual conference in September. It was, um, it was a hot topic, if you will. And um, I also had a chance to reach out to the uh, WRA and get some insight. WRA, Wisconsin Realtors Association, has been um, very involved in the short-term rental and tourist rooming house process. Um, and they have weighed in on what they want to see is a model ordinance. Now, that being said, we don't, it's not as if we just, you know, do whatever somebody else tells us to do, but it is important to have that, you know, stakeholder feedback and what that ordinance looks like. And I think we're going to get some comments later on um, those, those different types of um, ordinances. Now, as I've mentioned before, my, my one concern with the model ordinance that is being um, discussed, if you will, is it does have a zoning component. Um, and that has been a concern of mine, and it is still a concern of mine. And so how we go about doing that model ordinance with or without the zoning component is, the, from my perspective, the most significant issue. Um, and so I think we, we may be talking about that in greater detail in a little while. Um, so to sum up, um, we do not have a model ordinance yet, but there is discussion um, and there is a lot of discussion, um, you know, on, on multiple sides of stakeholders because this is obviously a very significant issue. Um, unfortunately, we have no input and no response from DSPS whatsoever. Um, which is unfortunate. Um, so that is, I have no update on that point. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Any questions for Rebecca? Could you remind the audience what DSPS is oh, for? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the Department of Safety and Professional Services. That is the regulatory uh, oversight um, agency for the state of Wisconsin um, that does everything from plumbing and building inspections to licensing of um, tanning salons. So they've got lots on their plate. Um, and then on the flip side, um, we also have been talking about DATCAP, which is the Department of, um, Department of Trade agriculture, trade, and consumer protection, sorry. Um, and so that is the other regulatory agency that um, is involved at the state level. Rebecca, Carol, what, uh, what about other um, counties? Have, have you seen anything from other counties recently on this topic? I know there's a lot of discussion going on across the area. Yes, um, so we have one county that we, um, we didn't work with that county in the development of their ordinance. Um, and frankly, I would never recommend that Sawyer County follow <laughs> this county because they are in litigation. Um, and it was, you know, oftentimes when you have knee jerk reactions to problems, um, there are knee jerk uh, legislative actions and resulting in ordinances that are not well thought out. Um, and that is, we've seen that happen. That's obviously not the case in Sawyer County since you have an ad hoc committee. Um, so there's some that I can say absolutely do not follow that path. There are some, there's quite a few actually, again, that use that zoning component that require a conditional use permit for short-term rentals. And again, that is, um, that is a, it's a, it's an option. And I, I'm starting to come to realize that that is probably the most frequent option. But again, I have concerns with that, again, rolling it into that zoning component. Then we see others um, that attempt to regulate um, based on whether a short-term rental meets the definition of hotel motel. Um, that one kind of came out of the blue. It's, uh, we have one county that we became aware of actually through WRA um, that, that raised that flag and said, you know, is this legally appropriate? Um, we're still looking at that. Um, I would not recommend that approach 
for Sawyer County at this point in time. Um, far too complicated um, making, I, I just would not recommend that. Um, so again, to answer your question, what we're seeing in other counties is um, regulation, but oftentimes regulation with a zoning component, which, you know, again, I have concerns with. Um, but if the committee um, in the county decides that that is the way that it wants to go about handling um, the specific policy concerns um, that have been raised, you know, that's certainly an option that we can, that we can talk about. Uh, Rebecca, Phil, Nice. Um, <laughs> last, on our last go around through this, we were actually looking at one point of doing it because the clumbersome nature of the conditional use permit, and especially now that we have 500, I mean, it would be, you know, quite a ways down the road to, for anything to happen. But at that time, we'd went over with special use permits and mm -hmm. uh, through the zoning. Is that is that anything that is feasible or not feasible? I just throw it out there. Yeah, that's a great question, Phil. And that is definitely something that I've been thinking about because, again, the point of the conditional use permit is to have a specific view of one property, one property's operations that is permitted under the zoning code as a conditional use permit, then with very specific conditions that are justified by substantial evidence um, by which that property has to operate. All great things. If we can somehow overlay that to a special use permit or some other um, permit that can get at and address those, those policy points like hours of operations, noise, garbage, traffic, parking, et cetera. That is definitely, um, definitely an option. And that is one that I've been leaning towards more. So think of it like a conditional use permit, but not a conditional use permit. Have it be a uh, use permit, but without going through the zoning process per se. I have a, a follow-up question then for you, Rebecca. This is Jay. Um, have you seen any counties deny conditional use permits for TRHs, those that do have that element of zoning? I have not, but that does not mean that it hasn't happened. I haven't right. sat with um, zoning committees when they've been looking at these um, I'm trying to think in the matter where we have litigation. Uh, that was more of a declaratory judgment action. It wasn't a, a specific denial that occurred to challenge the ordin ordinance. Um, it was a facial challenge. So no, I have not seen any. All right. I guess that's kind of the point I'm looking to make here is if, you know, we do wrap this into some type of zoning element and require whether they're conditional use permits or special use permits and they're going to be difficult to deny without substantial evidence. Why even go that extra step to bring over, Matt, I was just indicated 550 tourist rooming houses within Sawyer County? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge number. And that is where Sawyer County is different than the vast majority of other counties that we work with. Okay. Um, very particularized issues, not only from the, the sheer number but the uh, the size of your county, the amount of natural resources, the number of people, it's it's a very unique animal. Other counties are not looking at 500 and some um, conditional use permit applications every year. That's why a conditional use permit works for those counties. It doesn't necessarily work for Sawyer County. Now the difference, keep in mind, if it's a special use permit, you do you may not necessarily have to include those substantial evidence thresholds because we're not operating within the legal realm of a conditional use permit, Jay. So it, um, it would be, there wouldn't be as much deference if you would. Uh, it, it, or think of it that way. There wouldn't be much, there wouldn't be as much deference to the applicant under a special use permit as there would be under a 5969-5E conditional use permit application. Now, that's not to say that you can have 
high standards and high thresholds to be able to deny a special use permit? Absolutely not. But I'm just saying that that substantial evidence threshold may not come into play with a special use um, or some other type of different permit um, than a conditional use permit. Right, but a special use would still require a public hearing process. No, no. Okay. not necessarily. That's what I'm saying. And that's what, um, you know, think of it as like a Diet Coke version of a conditional use permit, to put it frankly. It's a, it would potentially be like a watered down conditional use permit. And I'm sure people aren't going to like to hear that term. Um, but if we can get at the regulatory policy concerns things like traffic, noise, parking, garbage, et cetera, notice having someone on site and, and hone in on all those and get those regulations in place. If we can do it in a less um, restrictive manner than a conditional use permit, maybe that's the best option. And it wouldn't require a public hearing. It may not require um, all of these to go to the zoning committee. It would be an internal um, approval process. In a way, you know, this Phil again, in a, in a way what Matt is currently doing is a special use permit, <laughs> except in right. reality. Yeah. Right. Right. And if we left it as it is within uh, that permitting process, uh, with uh, they, he also has all kinds of criteria which he he puts in. Uh, wouldn't we? I'm backing through my question, but wouldn't it necessarily be? He's almost issuing a special use permit currently when he issues the state. Is that a correct analysis or not? Yes, I think that is. Um, it's not a hundred percent identical, um, but yeah, you're on the right track, Phil. Absolutely. So then that raises the question, does the county want to look at this from a, the regulatory standpoint of a health and human services angle and have that um, more in-depth review process come from Matt's department? Um, and what are the legal options to do it that way? Because Matt's obviously working as an agent of the state and working you know, on behalf of, of DACAP. But is there something that could be done through Health and Human Services and the um, approval process on that end um, to get at some of these policy concerns? Well, Rebecca, this is Tweed. Um, mm -hmm. I see where Jay is going to need to add some staff then, but I like the direction of the special use permit. But does the special use permit expire like the gravel pits do their CUPs where we'd have to revisit this every five years or something? That's the beauty of it, Tweed, is that you can decide that. Um, as you are putting this, this thing together, this permit together, the county can decide from a, a policy standpoint, do you want it to be renewable every year? Do you want it to be renewable every three years, every five years? Um, you can look at all of those elements and decide. Now, obviously, there still has to be compliance with the state requirements, but so long as it's not preempted at the state level, you can make this function how you want it to function. If you want it to function like a gravel pit conditional use permit, you can do so. But the state requires an annual license, correct? Right. So from... Right, Matt, that's correct, right? Yes, correct. Okay, so you would still have the annual license that has to be completed at the state level. So the, you know, the, the MAP component, if you will. But if you're doing a special use permit that is um, in addition to or outside of what MAP does, then you could structure it in a different way. All right, thanks. And with annual permits and enforcement, Jay, you're going to need to add staff, and it still needs to be budget neutral. That would be correct. I'm sorry I muddied the water. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Rebecca. You're welcome. 
Um, our next uh, uh, item is we we brought up the previous um, ordinance that was done back in 2017 for review by the committee. And I'm going to start out by asking Phil, since he was the chair of that committee, to give us some background on that particular ordinance and how it came to be and what took place. Uh, I hope you had a chance to look it over because it was an excellent document. It was absolutely excellent. Uh, Cheryl was on the committee. Uh, Matt was on the committee. Uh, so, so was Laura and myself. And there were several others. But uh, we basically got it done in two months and two meetings and a lot of input. Uh, and that's where we tried to work around looking at, if you looked at the minutes, of, uh, and that's what ended up coming out basically into the ordinance which I still think was legal. But anyway, uh, having said that, but uh, one of the problems that, that actually we made a mistake within this, we tried to do too much of, I, I believe in my thing, which was, was uh, trying to regulate behavior and anything going forward. I mean, that, that it's, it's just, it's, it's almost impossible. You, you can't have the staff going out at three o'clock in the morning and there's too many people, there's fireworks, you know, the things that, that actually uh, wasn't under our purview, which ended up getting put in, but it was, it would be good, you know, host things that you don't want people doing, but uh, for us getting that in there, but we did go through the special use. That's the reason I brought it up again and looking at, an easy way because in 2000, I don't know how many there was in 2016 when this started, but maybe there was 50. Now we got 550. In another 10 years, we'll have 1,050. So whatever we design, we need we need to be doing it now because if, if we would have been able to get this done properly, we probably wouldn't be sitting here now. So uh, anyway, that's that's the story. Sorry, I'm asking the committee if there's discussion on this ordinance. Good. Okay, I think it would be a good idea. We've got people here that are very concerned, have been to all the meetings, um, to actually go through it line by line and then get input. I know we're not supposed to get input from the public right now, but I think as they see what we did, and I don't know if you guys have read through it all or not, but I think it would be a good idea because we did spend a lot of time in this, we covered a lot of it, and then we could point out to them, this was what the problem, this is why like in six weeks, the ordinance was rescinded, all right? So, I mean, we've already got a good framework here. There's a lot of stuff that's good and everyone agrees it's good, but we gotta find out what the problems are and make those changes and make it agreeable that it works for everybody. And I think we've got a good framework yeah, to start with. Which would be the only thing yeah i just have a question for you phil do you recall why the county board rejected the ordinance uh it's my it was that there was uh it came back from legal counsel that it, it was not uh legally enforceable and that it was an illegal uh that if anybody took court it was would not be defendable uh which I believe it was bad advice at the time. But the other aspect but, I do remember then as well um, is that this would have been as part of a zoning ordinance and the right. zoning ordinance would have required town approval, at least a majority of town approval, and it was never submitted to the towns for their review. Right. Rebecca? Yeah, that actually was my question. Um, I'm curious as to why... Uh, what the legal basis was um, for, you know, the the conclusion of non-enforceability, um, and I wasn't involved in that process, and I don't think Andy Phillips was either. So, Phil, I don't know if that is a or Jay, if that's another offline discussion. If if you want me to look at that in more detail before we start going through this um, line by line. Um, I can I can certainly do that. Part of the problem, so I remember part of the problem, somebody found in, uh, or TJ found, 
supposedly, or somebody found in the statutes, it says counties cannot regulate rental properties. And that was uh, cherry picking at the time later, as we look back on it. Uh, and there was a lot of pushback. I mean, uh, nobody wants to be regulated. Nobody, I mean, most of the, most all the people that presented stuff that we took, because we heard from a lot of people that had, uh, you know, tremendous complaints about this and that and so forth. But the majority of the host and the people, the management companies, were I, I think willing that they don't want to, they don't want to be bad actors or have have problems they're there to make a dollar and that's what it's about and uh, so I, I think at the end of the process uh, I don't think anybody was entirely happy but I think that was the best solution <laughs> you want Cheryl to read it through quick or it only take two minutes but if you want him to do it if you would like to yes All right, so we're going through both pages. Going, you got to get pages. up closer. Okay, going through all three pages. Do you guys have copies of it back there? Okay, it's online. If you can go online and get it, um, um, six point one one tourist rooming house. Purpose: The purpose of this ordinance is to promote the public health, safety, convenience, and general welfare to protect property values and the property tax base to provide healthy surrounding for family life. Definition. A tourist rooming house is the use of a single or two family dwelling for the purpose of providing or fur furnishing overnight lodging accommodations to the public for a period of less than 30 days per rental and derives an annual income from rental over $1,000 to any person or persons who occupies on a rental basis. Does not include hotels, motels, resorts, multifamily condominiums, private rooming houses, ordinarily conducted as such, not accommodating tourists or any other conditional use holders for lodging. I guess, why don't I stop there and see if there's any comments rather than going on, if anyone has any, if we can have comments from the public on something like this. The yeah. reason for the $1,000 was for the Berkey. Correct. Linda? I think part of the problem um, with what the county came up with as an ordinance was not at cap 72. So the definition of a tourist rooming house at a state level and the definition of a term, term house under the okay. So that's something that can be looked at then by Rebecca and get back to us if we would change something in there. Otherwise, would someone else have any recommendation? Can I just mention that uh, I could not hear Linda? Yeah, I couldn't either. Could I, okay. could I have point of yeah, order? Yeah. Can I have point of order? Yeah. Um, can we not allow public comments? We've already had public comments, and I think the purpose of the ad hoc is for us to make the decisions and the discussions. So I don't want to be here till three o'clock because there's going to be a lot of discussion from the public. If we could just discuss it and then at the next meeting have public comments on what we discuss, please. I think that's fair, yes. Okay. Want to let her finish reading or not? Or... <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. So I go ahead reading. Okay, no comments, but I'll continue reading. I better <laughs> spit my gum out for this one. Up there, I guess. Number one, tourist rooming house permit. The following conditions shall be required by the zoning department with review by the town board for any additional criteria that they would like the county to consider. This ordinance acknowledges but does not supersede Wisconsin Administrative Code Chapter ATCP 72. Small a approval. The approval by the zoning department shall be for a period of one year of operation. The one year period of operation shall commence on April 1st annually. However, a tourist rooming house permit shall not be issued prior to the property owner obtaining a tourist rooming house license from the state of Wisconsin and meeting all other criteria. K. A new permit is required with a change of ownership and must be acquired prior to operation. Uh, B is renewal. The tourist rooming house permit shall remain in effect provided the annual fee is paid and reviews by the zoning department confirms that the state tourist rooming house license has been obtained is current and the conditions set forth in K and all requirements of this chapter are adhered to. Reapplication by April 1st of the following year to the zoning department for renewal shall be required with a change in ownership, alterations to the operational rules, non-compliance with the standards of this chapter or substantiated violations to section K. Periodic inspections will take place at least once every three years. C, operational rules. All current information in section F1 to 5 and section K below 
rules shall be provided ten tenants to establish guidelines that the tenants must comply with regarding but not limited to all street parking, garbage collection, occupancy limits, fireworks, and excessive noise. The county will provide a copy of their operational rules to adjoining property owners within 300 feet. D, occupancy limits. The maximum number of tenants allowed to reside in the tourist rooming house for overnight accommodations shall not exceed 400 cubic feet of sleeping area per adult and 200 cubic feet of sleeping area per child, bedroom or bunk room. E, local contact. A local contact person shall be identified that will be responsible for current property owner's contact information for the property and have the property owner's contact information. Contact information. Current contact information shall be posted on an exterior wall near the main entrance of the residence only when the occupied by the renter with a minimum display area of five inches by seven inches. The following must be provided for a tourist rooming house. Number one, the address of the property. Number two, an emergency contact information. 911 fire police ambulance. Three, local contact person's telephone number. Four, maximum number of occupants allowed. And five, the permit number. G is signage. Owner may place one business sign at the driveway entrance when occupied by renter with a maximum display area of four square feet. H, recreational vehicles and camping equipment. The use of recreational vehicle or other camping equipment in conjunction with the rental to exceed maximum occupancy of the rental dwelling is prohibited. I, fines and revocation. Upon the occurrence of two substantiated and uncorrected violations of the operation rules within a calendar year, the owner may be subject to a fine and or revocation of the tourist rooming house permit approval, depending on the severity of the violation and corrective action taken. Any person may request a hearing with regard to a permit holder to determine whether or not the permit holder has committed violations of this chapter, such that the permit should be revoked. A person shall request a public hearing by submitting a written statement to the zoning administrator, setting forth in detail complaints against the permit holder. The enforcement or the, the zoning administrator shall investigate the allegations and determine whether or not an enforcement proceeding shall be initiated under Section K and or whether a hearing is warranted to determine if a permit shall be revoked. If the zoning administrator determines a hearing is warranted, it shall be held before the zoning committee pursuant to the procedure set forth for public hearings by Sawyer County. There shall be no appeal from the zoning administrator's denial of a request for a hearing or to refer a matter for enforcement. The zoning administrator shall also have authority to initiate enforcement or a hearing under Sawyer County citation ordinances. J, the fees. The fee for a tourist rooming house permit is $250 with an annual renewal fee of $200. Fines include up to $250 daily for failure to obtain a commit permit. Fines for non-compliance with Section K include up to $150 daily. Applicants uncorrected violations of this ordinance in the prior year may lead to loss of tourist rooming house license for the coming year. Criteria, this is K now the one it keeps referring to. Criteria, obtain necessary permits, town slash zoning, health department, etc. Two, all to applicable taxes must be paid, room tax, et cetera. C, or three, adequate sanitary system. Four, property line must be identified or designated to the tenant. Five, occupancy limits per structure. Six, all state of Wisconsin fire requirements must be, must be met per Wisconsin SPS 314. Seven, proof of certificate of insurance for rental commercial liability, et cetera. Eight, contact numbers must be available for current local owner agent and owner agent must be available 24 hours per day. Nine, boating and fishing regulations are included in rental information for lakeshore property. 10, no RVs, pop-up campers, tents, or other means of overnight, stay, overnight stays to exceed maximum occupancy of the rental dwelling allowed. 11, all vehicle and utility trailer parking must be contained on the property, not allowed to park on roads. 12, all campfires must be attended. 13, Quiet hours from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. 14, pets must be restricted to the property. 15, property must remain free from illegal activity. 16, trespass laws must be abided by at all times. 17, no fireworks allowed. 18, these criteria may be amended from time to time as deemed necessary for public health and safety. Citation, ordinance update add 11.3, uh, action conducted without specified permit. Five, tourist rooming house permit. Uh, deposit $250, ordinance sections ZO 6.11, and then 11.26, violation of tourist rooming house permit, violation of 6.11K, deposit 150, ordinance 6.11K. 
definitions update add 95 tourist rooming house the use of a single or family dwelling for the purpose of providing or providing or furnishing overnight lodging accommodations to the public for a period of less than 30 days per rental and derives an annual income from rental over $1,000 to any person or person who occupies on a rental basis. Does not include hotels, motels, resorts, or their conditional use holders for lodging. So that's what we did back in 2016-17. We, we, we were. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of complaints. We covered a lot of things. And that's why I say the public, knowing all of this that we have, I think we have a good basis, a good skeleton here to start from, and then to make any changes or where you see problems, where we need to have corrections, and how we can make it legal. If it's a special permit type of thing, if it's not through zoning and through the health department, whatever it is, to make it workable for everybody, because we do need tourist rooming houses in Sawyer County. Ms. Hessel. So it seems to me that 1C, the operational rules, are the only place that we, we, we initiated overreach, or the committee at that time initiated overreach. Am I wrong on that? It's the operational rules. I think the, operation, me. I think the overreach was the operational rules. Right. So if we took that out, would this be, would this be a good um, ordinance? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that uh, personally ordinance is the way to go. I, I think that if it's a special use ordinance, if that's what we want to do, but I think zeroing back and taking this as a building block for, for going through human services is in the building blocks are, you know, what is the problems are? One of the problems is you know, uh, over occupancy. And that's one thing. So we can can try to uh, at least limit or control. And supposedly, you know, there are limits or controls what they are. But uh, I don't. I guess uh, I didn't want to <laughs> bring all uh, bring all this back out again to you know try to reinvent the wheel that was reinvented. But maybe we should be really looking after we hear Matt's presentation of what he's really doing and see how that all these pieces fit and. Uh, uh, and I will give the, the committee credit from the 2017. I mean, it was a, it was a task, but uh, anyway. Matt. Uh, this is more for Rebecca, Rebecca, Matt. Um, we do, I do have a copy of the letter from the previous attorney that gave us guidance not to go forward with this ordinance and to rescind what was done. Uh, so I can provide that information for you as a means to, help if we're going to go forward with using what was created back then and try to um, build off of that, I can provide that letter to you so you can kind of see what those issues were. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. So, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's only a few things in this previous ordinance, which I would have question marks by. Um, one is as letter I, and that the zoning administrator determines if a hearing is warranted for violations or revocation of a, of a tourist rooming house permit. I guess I would want some additional language added in there as to the severity of violations, because uh, that leaves it pretty arbitrary as to my discretion as to whether or not a hearing, a hearing is warranted. Um, for these types of, of violations. And then I, I have to go back to letter K, number three, adequate sanitary system. And what is an adequate sanitary system at that point? That's It's not defined in this ordinance. And that's one of the things that we've at least identified. Um, also in, in um, under J, you know, this talks about these fees and violations who enforces that is that originally with this was a zoning ordinance it would have been in zoning but now we're talking about shifting this over to hhs i think if we go the form of of the previous ordinance or if that's you know to to have an element of zoning this most likely then would have the feel of a zoning ordinance yeah i, I don't know how you could shift that aspect over to the health department Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff in here about communication that I really like. I mean, especially 
you know, the contact numbers being available. Obviously, this is contact information that's available to the renters, but would that also be available to the neighbors? It was in the, it was to be on the uh, posted. What's that say? Yeah, it was, it was to be posted so the neighbors would have be able to call the person. Uh, in the original discussion was that we could call Matt and say, hey, you got a problem. And uh, mm -hmm. then you could try to address it. Hopefully that's the idea at the time was hopefully that would occur rather than getting a hold of Jay and somebody trying to uh, find somebody, you know, let's, let's cure, let's cure the problem. Or having to pull in the sheriff's department. Yeah. Well, you know. Doug wouldn't come anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's another one to bring up. I mean, if you're looking at sending out notifications to property owners within 300 feet, let's say there's uh, five within 300 feet, five times 550, you're looking at over 3,000 or well, 2,500 to 3,000 letters that the zoning department has to send out to notifications to adjacent property owners. That's kind of what that but previous does, ordinance said. Yeah, it does say that. And that was something that was critical because you get the people that are next to our neighbors that they're squirting the stuff in there and they want to know who do they call. Because you go over there and you talk to these, tell you, then they tell you to F off. All right. Because they're there, have a good time and they don't care and they're going to be gone two days from now and they don't give a rip. All right. So you have to be able to call the people who's responsible, who's paying the property taxes on it. You have to be able to get hold of somebody that either they're here or they have like property owner management company here in town that is taking care of it for them. And they get the call at, you know, 10 o'clock or two o'clock, wherever it might be. At the time, Jay, in 2016 and 17. We didn't have 550. Understand. It wasn't 550. It was. Well, plus 50. I think that, that that responsibility should fall on the property owner, not on zoning. And that's what could be written in there. Right. And that's one of those, yeah, that's letter C of those operational rules that I would think we'd want to potentially make some amendments if we are looking at potentially picking this previous ordinance back up or at least using that as a template moving forward. I stayed in an Airbnb a week ago, last Thursday night actually up in the two harbors and they have right in there laying on the table, they have their permit to be occupied and it's a calendar year, January 1 to December 31st. $535, a permit number right on. So one year they're paying 535. That's in two harbors. We have, yeah, this item is not for action today. It's for discussion. And this is a great discussion. I think what we should do is consider bringing it back in a future meeting and, and you know, doing just what we're talking about picking out what we would like to see, making recommendations for changes, and then see where that fits in our overall recommendation back to county board. The other item uh, under B, um, that uh, very last line, periodic inspections will take place at least once every three years. I think we need to be more definitive with that um, rather than once every three years. For instance, that it must be done once every two years. Yeah. Too much changes in a three-year period of time. So I guess I'd like uh, we have next on the agenda. I guess uh, I'd like to hear because we need to we need to know what we got in place for sure, yeah. and that's what Matt's going to tell us. I think yes, so. that that's going to give us some context. Any well, more discussion on this? Yeah, I got it, Ginny. Are we directing then legal to review this and come back to us next meeting with their edits? Yes, I think that's very important. I agree. Rebecca, are you good with that? Yes, that's fine. Okay, thank you. All right, excellent discussion, folks. Thank you for that. Um, our next topic, this is going to be an overview of the current process given by Matt. All right, so as you know, we are an agent of the state and I'm actually gonna take over and share my screen. And, um, the, but as to become an agent of the state, we had to have ordinances. And those ordinances are here posted. Um, and they are very much the same. If you go from county to county, we pretty much have very similar language. So um, that was put in place before becoming an agent. Everything that we um, 
had done in 2018 uh, was approved by the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection. So not only our ordinances, um, but also we had to create a uh, plan for the agent of the state program. And so basically outlines what we do as sanitarians from handling licensing to doing inspections to handling uh, complaints to whatever it addresses that. And now that's, that's, you know, it's a growing document that we're free to build off of at any time we want. It doesn't necessarily have to go back to DACAP to, for review. It's there to have a base and we can build off of it as we, as we grow. Um, so bear with me one second. I'm going to pull up my screen. I'm going to give a presentation. It is a little long, but I'm going to go really quick. So uh, any questions that the committee has, I appreciate if you'd hold them to the end. All right. Uh, sorry. Let me just... My computer's a little slow. Here we go. All right. Um, so no introduction there. Uh, again, we fall under the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection, uh, the code that addresses lodging, which is also hotel, motel, and tourist rooming houses, is ATCP 72. Who does it protect? Tourists or transient, which means a person who travels to a location away from his or her permanent address for a short period of time for vacation, pleasure, recreation, culture, business, or employment. Um, someone will ask, you know, in the previous document, um, it mentioned about, you know, 30 days of uh, falls as a, a definition of a transient or for a tourist rooming house. Um, it could be 30 days. That's what most, um, say, counties go by, um, but it's not necessarily defined. It basically how we look at it is, does that person receive their mail at that address? If they're there for 60 days and they're getting their, their mail, we consider that a long-term stay. Um, but, and I'd say 99% of our situations, it's week longs to maybe two week long scenarios. We might have somebody that stays for a month or whatever, but again, do they receive their mail there? Um, is kind of how we base that stay and that license. Again, these are lodging facilities um, that could be a hotel, motel, and or tourist rooming house. Um, and then the next slide here kind of describes how we, uh, we have different categories of lodging licenses. So the first one being one to four rooms, which is a tourist rooming house, um, could be a lake rental, um, you know, private homeowners, and it's a single keyed unit. Again, that's for one to, now they say, they use the word rooms in here. It's really kind of uh, misleading because if I have a five bedroom tourist rooming house on a lake, it's one unit. It's one license. They get put into a tourist rooming house category, even though they have five bedrooms. So the word unit and rooms kind of mean the same thing. Um, whereas when prior to us, uh, Becoming an agent, when we took some of this information on, it was some of our facilities had been licensed incorrectly, and it was a tourist rooming house, but it was licensed as a, say they had a five or six bedroom, it was licensed as the next category up, which is the second one, second bullet here, uh, where they have five to 30 rooms, um, oftentimes where we see uh, resorts, they might have five, six, uh, eight cabins, and they would get licensed as this category, the LH1, um, basically what it is, is a different fee for these different, uh, the more rooms you have it increases your fee for that license. Um, because that's based on amount of time that we are spending out there to, you know, do a pre-inspection on it, to license it and to do our annual inspections on it. So it's just how much time, how many rooms that we do. We don't, we can't go, if somebody's got a 99, room a hotel unit we can't get into every single room uh, one because people are staying there two it would take us a week just to go through every single room so we do a percentage we try to get a variety of rooms and uh, get into as many as we can that's reasonable and look at any patterns that we see um, you know if you get into two rooms you can kind of see what kind of quality all the work they're doing. If it's sketchy, obviously we're going to see more rooms. If they're doing a great job, we don't have to get into every single one. 
Um, so yeah, and so on and so forth. We got the third category from 31 to 99 rooms, 100 to 199 and 200 plus. I don't think we have any 200 plus here in Sawyer County. Um, so when somebody contacts us uh, via phone call, email, um, they are asking for information. How do I get started? And working with the realtors in Sawyer County, they have done an excellent job of providing information. So if they have somebody that's interested in a home and they want to make it a rental, there, it seems like they're guiding them to us to get that information, which we appreciate. Um, so most people know now uh, that these have been so popular and, and a growing trend. People know that they need to be licensed. So they're not too many are trying to hide it anymore. So um, when we get contacted, we're giving them this information. We have a template email that is already prepared. So we don't have to recreate everything, drop their name in there, send it out. And we get a lot of comments on this as being good comments, meaning that this is very easy to follow, very well laid out, um, not a ton of hoops to jump through. And it's it, we explained everything pretty well to them. And if they have questions, they contact us. I like to meet with them on the phone if I'm going to go out and do the pre-inspection on it. Um, get ask them questions, and so that way there's no surprises. There, I'd say 95% of these places are um, you know close to 100% on getting their license. They might have a few corrections that they need to, but it's because of the preparation. Um, one that they they have done one what also we have done in educating and giving the materials that they need to be ready. So it's not an ongoing process, and it takes two months, three months to get their license. I would say average is 30 days and probably even less than that. I can get one. If I go out today and do an inspection, if everything is good, I can release a license that day. So it's just a matter of how long it takes for them to make any corrections. I can get back out there, um, confirm that they made these corrections. Sometimes they can just send me photos and videos and that's all we need to do. Um, so it had been discussed earlier about scenarios um, on how we license uh, situations where uh, somebody might own more than one lodging, uh, tourist rooming house facility adjacent to each other. So this is one example where Mr. Smith owns property A, C, and the two units on property D. Mr. Smith is going to need a license for that separate separate license for property A. He will need a separate license tourist rooming house license only one though for property c and d but he will need yet a third license for the bed and breakfast the purple house there because bed and breakfasts are licensed differently than tourist rooming houses because of the fact they serve food and they have to meet other requirements so when we get a situation where somebody owns uh properties adjacent to each other and they own the land in between they can fall under one license. And this is based off the guidance provided by the state. Another scenario where somebody might have four lots that they own adjacent to each other. They, if they own all the property in between and they're exactly, they are adjacent, they can fall under one license, even though they have four units or four properties. Another scenario, this is a condo association. Um, the three houses in the middle uh, ones without the black border around them, those uh, say are just homeowners that do not advertise, do not rent. The gray cabin, that is a rental property. They have their own separate license, whereas the people on the right side that own the green cabins, they are the same owner, um, but they require two separate licenses because they do not own the land in between. It belongs to the condo associations. So they would be required to have individual license for those two units. I'll open up real quick, just for the sake of these scenarios. Does anybody have any questions on that aspect? You got a quick one. If, uh, if I owned one property and I used that as a, a short-term rental, I bought the property next to me, which is a scenario that happens a lot when something comes up for sale. Mm -hmm. And so then the uh, I buy that one. They're two separate systems, septic systems. And one of the one of the things that we've talked about here is septic systems. And so con consequently, I'd be under one license. You you would combine if you were using bedrooms or whatever occupancy. You would combine the occupancy. 
How would you do that? For this, for the condo association scenario? No, just, just for individual. I bought two, I have two lots. I, I own two houses next to each other. Okay. And, and they're both septic. They're not on the same septic. Okay. okay. Yeah. One of them's three bedroom, the other one's three bedroom. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you determine what is inadequate? Uh, how do you determine what the occupancy is for that license then? Yeah, good question. And I'm trying to think if I've had that scenario, um, but maybe I would divert that to Eric uh, to, to address that in his <laughs> uh, his coming up presentation. But, um, you know, so again, in in the past, we have not necessarily practiced looking at the sizing of the septic system. So, and I think that's going to lead me to my next uh, couple slides here. Um, but again, there are certain aspects that we look at for septic systems, but addressing, like look, diving in and looking into what they have installed, that is not the current practice. It is the step that we are asking to use as a tool going forward. And I'll get to that here in just a second. Um, so currently, as you know, as we've talked about in previous uh, meetings that we um, address occupancy by the cubic footage of the room. Now, notice it says sleeping room and it does not say bedroom. They do not, the state does not define a bedroom. So you could have a traditional three bedroom home, but yet then maybe downstairs in the walkout basement, they have a rec space that they have added two um, double queen bunk beds. Okay. Well, if that room is, you know, half the size of this room, they got plenty of room, right? So they can accommodate because they have the cubic footage to address the number of uh, children or adults. We that's so that's where we are seeing some of those issues with more and more people in these facilities that were originally designed for. Um, so, but again, when we took this on as an agent of the state, this was the current practice and has been. And again, so we have not looked at sizing of septic systems really at this point. Okay, so here is that other code, number uh, 72105, that we have talked about previously, is that a private sewage disposal system as defined in statute 145.01.12 uh, um, is permitted when a public sewer facility is not available to the premise. The system shall be located on the premise and shall be designed, constructed, and operated in accordance to uh, DSPS 382 and 383, as well as the state statute 145.245. Okay, so this is that other tool that we've been talking about that we are have discussions about whether or not this is this a way that we want to go forward to address occupancy along with the other issues and, and our concerns for septic systems as you know years go on and these systems get stressed, you know we want to be able to address these things now before, you know, as, as Jay mentioned, these are, this is growing and growing and we're going to see more and more. I got this just this week. I, in the next week I've had probably over half a dozen new properties that I'm going out and doing pre-inspections for. It's a growing trend. We see it slow down during the summer, but then come spring and fall, that's when they, we pick up again and we're getting out to more and more of these properties. So it won't be long before we're at that 600 mark and it's going to continue. Um, but as I mentioned, currently what we're looking at when we go out to do inspections is, you know, ponding around the tanks. Um, mushy ground is one spot much more greener than the other. And the biggest thing is that we're looking for is um, the septic lids. Are they secured as they were uh, required to do by code? And a lot of times that's not done because one, um, you know, maybe the homeowner at the time of uh, selling it or purchasing it, they had the septic system pumped and they cut the lock, cut the chain. It just hasn't been repaired. You know, so that's one of the things that we're looking for as a requirement to get a license. Um, we obviously are looking for uh, health and safety, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide detectors that they are not more than 10 years old. They, they've been approved by the, you know, with the UL code. They're in working order and they're installed in the right locations. Um, we're making sure utensils are sanitized. They have three different options for sanitizing utensils. We ask questions, they fill us in, and based on whatever their answers are, is tell them that that's how they need to then make sure they're practicing and going forward. 
to ensure this. Um, Furnishings, equipment, utensils, I have gone into places where I've seen broken beds, bro broken furniture, chairs, whatever it be. We're making sure that the beds have clean sheets. Uh, we are doing inspections for bed bugs, whether that's for tourist rooming houses or uh, hotels or whatever resort, whatever it is, um, that they are providing clean linens and uh, soap and hand towels in the bathrooms, that kind of stuff. One of our biggest hangups that slow the process of getting a license is issues with decks because if they're not to current code, uh, which we're not, we're not, and I should have mentioned this at the very beginning, we're not certified HVAC people, we're not certified plumbers, we're not certified electricians, uh, car contractors or um, uh, carpenters, that, that kind of stuff. We're there to put our eyes to the test and make sure that there's nothing outstanding that is immediate imminent danger okay and so we don't necessarily look to see when the deck was built or not always do we look to see when the home was built but are there boards that are rotting out are the guardrails 36 inches in height do they have spindle gap spacings that are less than four inches those are the main safety concerns that we are looking for we don't look to see if you know the underneath that the treads are spaced at one foot or 16 inches or whatever. We don't look at everything um, per every single code because we just can't possibly know every code out there for all those types. But there are certain codes that are, we are required to know as an agent of the state. Um, making sure there's handrails on staircases. Um, that's the, the small round handrail on the side as you're going down the steps. Um, tubs, we're making sure that they have their slip resistant. So if they have a really old tub that doesn't have any texture built into them, you get it. Uh, soap and hand towels, mentioned that before. Um, one of our smoke and fire, smoke and carbon monoxide detectors are a critical item as well as observing any insects, more so like on the lines of mice, rats, that kind of stuff. Um, it's northern Wisconsin. We do see evidence of mice getting into places. It's ensuring that, you know, we're noting it and that they're taking effective measures to address it and that they're cleaning up and safely sanitizing behind that activity. So um, they don't lose a license just because a mouse got in the house, that kind of stuff. Um, note the top right hand corner is not a tourist rooming house. I just put that in there too for dramatic effect. But um, in general, we're looking at for overall um, health and safety. We're look we ask a lot of questions about garbage and um, you know what their plans are for garbage and recycling. Um, again, every hotel, motel, and tourist rooming house shall be maintained and equipped in a manner conducive to health, health, comfort, and safety for its guests. We make sure the outside exteriors where you know, no tripping hazards in the driveway or I've had some where they've had significant potholes in them where one could kind of almost fall and trip in. So um, we're looking at all those major safety issues. Another requirement is that they post their license when they get it that needs to be visible to the public or the people staying in those units. Uh, if it's like a hotel motel, it's gotta be posted at their front desk where they do business. And another requirement is that the place has some form of registration. Our code number code 72 is a little bit dated and is currently being worked on by the state and being revised as we speak. It'll probably be another two years before the final code comes out and expect that there will be some changes and a lot to tourist rooming houses. So just because the old code um, was designed more on the side of lodging, uh, the hotels and motels and not the tourist rooming houses. Um, and most nowadays that a lot of the registration for rental properties is done through like if they have a platform such as Airbnb or VRBO, that's their means of being able to look up contact information. Uh, another requirement is making sure they have safe drinking water. So we collect a water sample, which is uh, an automatic if they are not on municipal water. And um, we run that in our own lab here. So we have built that in so that way we don't have to take money in the field and it makes the process so much easier and smoother. And we've gotten a lot of comments that they people really appreciate that we've gone that route. It's just, they don't have to worry about it. It's done automatically, speeds up the process. Violations, like I mentioned, if they have a violations, they typically have 30 days. Sometimes deck issues take longer 
we give them that time because they need to line up that person to do that work and it's not doesn't happen overnight so um there are other ways to address violations uh, that can be through variances through getting state approval on certain scenarios such as law spaces or something like that um and if they have a deck issue in the middle of winter um we can you know, if they're applying for a new license, but they can't really address a deck issue in the middle of winter, but yet they want to move forward with a license, we can write something up saying that they will can do the work by a certain time frame. If they don't, that could be subjective to losing their license. Real quick, I'm just going to go through a couple of scenarios. We talked about septic systems. These are all pictures that I believe every single one of these is ones that I have taken uh, in the field. So it was just septic systems not being secured. That one was actually left open that somebody could have fell in. Uh, checking well casings, making sure there's no gaps for insects, rodents to get in and jeopardize the quality of the water. Got ponding of water in the crawl space of a rental property. Talk about decks, staircases, guardrails, spindles, that kind of stuff. These are all things that needed to be corrected. Wiring, you know, we're not certified electricians, but this is not acceptable. So we make sure that these things are, are taken care of. Rodent activity. I think on the one on the left, on the right is pretty evident that um, there's a situation there that we want to avoid. Uh, the one on the left is maybe you can't quite see what that uh, violation would be is that the safety rail of a bunk bed is um, the, the safety rail is no longer serving its uh, purpose because the mattress is as tall as the top of the safety rail. So their, their fix is to put a higher safety rail or reduce the thickness of the mattress. Again, no handrails going up and down the steps. Uh, we can't have heaters that are not vented so ventless heaters this is gets seen often enough that they cannot allow those to be in the rental units again uh secondary habitable structures such as those mini sheds that are dropped on site and made into bunk houses or whatever not acceptable in most situations again testing for drinking water anybody see what the issue might be here <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's not so evident to some people but yeah so we making sure bunk beds are not placed under ceiling fans uh we make sure food items the uh, only food items that are allowed in rentals are um pre-packaged single serve so we're making sure that personal food items are removed um or put away so they can't be accessed uh, the guests aren't leaving stuff such as ketchup mustard that's pretty common we encourage them to take that stuff back with them all right, I know that was probably a little bit longer than expected, but hopefully it gives paints a pretty good picture of what we do and what we look for um, and the process that we, we go about licensing a facility. I think it was good to hear that because we don't want to repeat anything that you are currently doing in in what you got going there so and okay. just the point that was just a lot of the common issues that we see it does not address everything not everything is listed in there <laughs> and we cannot write codes and enforce codes for every type of scenario that may come about. So basically you try to use the code that best represents and what is the purpose or the intent of that code and try to apply it to that scenario or that situation. When you issue that permit to the individual or to the facility, uh, is there an occupancy number on it? Not at this time. There is no. not. No. If you do a motel or hotel, is there an occupancy number? It's, uh, they are um, licensed by the number of rooms. They're not individually roomed licensed then. It wouldn't be, I can remember being in a motel someplace, occupancy was four or so oh, um, on the door in the back. Right. Yeah. Um, we don't no, do that. Just, okay. Yeah. I just want. That might be fire code for those rooms when they put those on. We have room yeah. rates. Yeah. And stuff like that. But um, our, our part of our responsibility is not to say that the hotel can only accommodate this many people total that is not in the license thank you yeah thanks you know, there, i think that's really good perspective um and that's kind of what the theme of our, our meeting today was was you know we, we need to get some get our feet on level ground here and look at what has been done and what's currently being done and then 
hopefully, you know, that'll help us decide where we want to go moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions for Matt? Okay, we've got one more very important thing, and that is on um, the recommendation for sewer system sizing. So this is where we left off in our last meeting, and we wanted to take some time and get some more information for you, which Eric has done. So he's going to go ahead and share that with us now. Okay. Um, I don't have as fancy a slides as Matt does. We'll just keep it black and white here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about tourist rooming houses and septic systems. Um, term that you've heard, the acronym POUTS stands for Private On-Site Wastewater Treatment Systems. It's also synonymous with septic system or private sewage disposal system. And like Matt was talking about, different state agencies have different terms and definitions, definitions for what might be the same thing. Um, and Matt went over this on the previous slide in DATCAP. There are two sections of the tourist rooming house, motels, hotels, that relate to occupancy. One paragraph talking about septic systems, the other sleeping size volume area. So I'm gonna be talking about the septic system aspect of it. Um, I'm gonna answer some questions that Matt brought up and others in the committee, um, uh, and then also revisit uh, two items that we've talked about, I think the previous three meetings. So uh, the first one, design flow. Um, is from a state code uh, SPS. In order to accommodate peak wastewater flow, the design flow of a pouch shall be equal to at least 150% of the estimated flow generated from the source or sources unless otherwise approved by the department. So that's where I'm coming up with these gallon per day numbers, whether it's residential or commercial. Uh, next one to answer Matt Dale's question regarding metering. I don't have good news for you, Matt. Um, wanted to make sure I had all the details for you, but another section in SPS 383, um, when doing uh, metering of wastewater generated in a facility, you measured daily wastewater flows over a period of time representative of the facility's use or occupancy. A detailed estimate of wastewater flow based upon per capita occupancy or usage of facility or per function occurrence within the facility. That's out of code. The next page is my notes basically saying, if you're gonna use TRH design flow, you have to use the peak flow reading or 1.5 times, whichever is higher. And you need a minimum of 30 daily meterings of occupants and gallons generated. Um, next item, uh, we talked about potentially pumping more frequently or the need to do that. I was hoping Chris was here to help supplement some input here, but um, I've talked to her and uh, she agrees it's, it's more important to monitor and inspect the entire system than to increase pumping frequency. If you have a three bedroom tank and a two bedroom drain field, pumping the tank more frequently will not result in increased occupancy. Your, your limiting factor is any one of the components of that septic system. So increased pumping isn't necessarily a benefit at all, and it shouldn't gain you any increase in occupancy. And then back to residential sizing, uh, basically uh, residential sizing in SPS 383 is two persons per bedroom or 150 gallons per day per bedroom. Um, commercial sizing using the appendix uh, and the formula uh, that you've seen on um, the tables that I've created allow for the ability with additional steps and permits and recording documents to do three persons per room Again, there's a confusion in state agencies' terms and definitions. It says three persons per room, not necessarily per bedroom, and that's 65 gallons per room. The next slide is the one you've seen uh, previous tables, the math that I've done equivalency, um, gallons per day, estimated flow, design flow calculations to come up with the difference between two persons per bedroom, residential, or three persons per bedroom commercial. And on commercial sizing, if this is an option that the committee recommends to 
committees of jurisdiction and county board, there are additional steps that would be required. Uh, proof of a sanitary permit on file that's been approved by either the county or the state. And in addition, um, sec, uh, 383, 25, parent 2, parent E, where the performance capability of the existing pout serving a dwelling is not based on the number of bedrooms within the dwelling, informational documenting, uh, information documenting that the design condition shall be recorded as a covenant running with the deed for the property. So we need to record a document at register deeds if the property is interested in doing this commercial sizing um, change, I'll call it. So I came up with six remedies for this topic of septic systems and tourist rooming house occupancy. Um, I thought of these and maybe there's others or maybe we want to omit some of these, but you could increase any or all of the pouts components to meet occupancy requirements. You could record a document, as I stated earlier, for the design flow and sizing changes. You could lower occupancy to meet the current septic system that's on the property. You could try metering TRHs. Uh, the state departments, both DATCAP and DSPS, could uh, amend their codes to um, update to current TRH um, requirements, whatever that might be, or we can keep it status quo. Um, and the last slide is my analogy to conclude with and, and leave you for thinking about uh, this topic. Would the Coast Guard allow over capacity of a boat as long as each person on board had a life jacket? So with that, I'm open to answer any questions and uh, listen to any is, advice. Eric, the last thing on there, what is status quo, I guess, when you got to six? What is? Well, the, the current process for licensing, I guess, would be status quo. Just, we do nothing. It is. You're basically, just, we're doing nothing at status quo. Well, I mean, currently well, whatever licensing we're currently TRHs, doing, but this committee's done then. If we do do status quo, it depends on. No, uh, I asked a question. Is, yeah. is, is that, that what status quo is? would be to wait for guidance, keep things the way they are, I guess. Oh, I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you. No. Any other questions or discussions on this topic? Questions for Eric? Does anybody know of any other remedies that I missed? <laughs> no. And I guess I'll throw that out to whether it's pulse related or like I said, any other tools that we could be looking at as ways to address some of the situations that we've been seeing increases in. With regards to the commercial versus residential sizing, this is still a subject that we have not officially taken a vote on. I'm not sure if the the committee is interested in doing so at this time. But I throw that on the floor and see if there's any any interest in making a motion regarding commercial sizing. Okay, we've got a motion to table and a second. All those who approve? Aye. Aye. And against? Not the all opposed. Okay, we've got one opposed. I think it just makes sense to table for legal guidance on everything else. You know, we're we're in discussion only until we get that legal guidance. Very good. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, future agenda items. I what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about where we're at um, to date. Um, there was a few things that we had for future agenda items that have actually been um, discarded. One of them was the um, definition of a resort. And right now that's being handled by zoning with the towns. And I think that's probably the proper way to handle that. So um, we're not looking at that specifically right now. The other thing was the, um, the shared driveways issue. And that came up, um, Brian had suggested that there's problems there with shared driveways as it relates to rentals and um we thought it was at the time a good thing to bring up legal has recommended that the county not get involved in that or in the place of you know trying to regulate or recommend um covenants 
or deeds being made for these shared driveways as it relates to rentals. So that's where we're at on those. Um, I still plan on having more discussion on the education side of it. There's several good um, examples that we have right now from the lake associations where people are putting this documentation together. I noted in the original ordinance that we just went through that that was one of the things that was mentioned was you have to have some sort of information from the lake association on fishing rules for that particular body of water. So that's obviously something that was discussed then too. Um, another thing in the town of Round Lake, we are talking about doing a um, sort of a visitor's guide at the town level. That might be something that would be more effective in this case, because not all TRHs are on water. You know, most of them, there's a lake association there, but sometimes there isn't. And this is, there's still information about fireworks, you know, noise ordinances, whatever else that the community wants to put in there to tell these visitors um, should come from someplace. So it might be something that goes to the town level. So any other agenda items anybody would like to recommend at this point? Yeah, at some point, are we going to discuss license fees? And is that something we're to discuss, Jay? And plus your additional staff you're going to need, or is that going to maybe just license fees at this level? Yeah, I think that probably is something we'd want to address if we we're going to make any changes to the current operation. I mean, right now, the uh, tourist rooming house licensing is you know, held within the health department and they do require fees for those licensing permits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we are looking at picking up more of a, a zoning ordinance or using the template that we, you know, had previously adopted and was rescinded. Um, yeah, there, there's going to need to be discussion on fees as well as potential staffing for whatever could be um, approved or recommended or put into ordinance form. I don't know if that needs to be addressed yet. It would be as to what comes to fruition with this committee as to what their recommendation is to a higher level. Um, because if it is to adopt that previous zoning ordinance or use some other elements, um, there would be consideration needed for additional staffing. Yeah, I agree. I'm not sure that this committee is required to figure out how to fund it. You know, um, the committee is coming up with recommendations and ideas, and it may require funding, but it's not necessarily up to us to figure that out. That's tweets, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and HHS does bring forward a new fee schedule based on, every few years, um, just due to increases in staffing and what that costs. And so that would be coming forward, but it would have nothing to do with what this committee is deciding or talking about today. Okay. And as Cheryl mentioned, sounds like there might be some baselining with other, you know, other counties or other areas where they have similar situations and see what the the fee structure should be. Maybe, maybe there's room there to change it. Yeah. And and right now what we base it on is our expenses and coverage of expenses. So Okay. currently within HHS, not having to do with any other departments, just so that's clear when that comes forward. Yeah, as a requirement for agent of the state is that we can't just feel free to make a fee whatever we want. We have to be able to justify that uh, fee increase. And like, like Julia says, that outside of whatever is decided here, if it has any influence on our fees, but at this time, most likely this year, we'll probably be looking at a fee increase just because it's been a couple of years. So, Matt, how many how many people do you have? There are three sanitarians. Okay. At this time, mm -hmm. yep. along with yep. yeah, yep. additional support staff uh, in in our department as well that help us. Um, they help us uh, keep track of appointments and they do uh, when, with water test results at the end of the day, they file, record and send out emails. So yeah, we have a lot of support staff as well. Is that the same amount that you had back in 20 or whenever you were first appointed? When we first agent? started as an agent, there was two of us. And so we've grown to the point where we definitely need it because mm -hmm. as again, as another requirement as an agent that we have to be able to 
uh, accomplish and get out to all these facilities in a reasonable time, which is an annual inspection. But um, we, even now with three of us, we're having a very hard time to get to every place every year. Um, but part of that issue is that because we have so many seasonal facilities in our county that uh, we just can't get to them because during the bit summertime, there's people there, they're running full tilt, and that's not the best time to come in and do an inspection uh, for like lodging hotel uh, for, for tourist rooming houses because they're booked day in and day out for all summer long. So some of those get put off to the spring or the fall, but yeah. There's three of us now. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that it's not just for tourist rooming houses. That is for all of our licensing that we do through the agent program for the staffing. So that includes restaurants, hotels, everything. The restaurants. Nine, uh, wow. Yeah, we have 950-ish, give or take a little bit, licensed facilities. So for every license, there's an inspection. So yeah, we, we are busy. Yep. Uh, if I can offer a comment, uh, <laughs> we got to be careful when we're going down these rabbit holes because one of the things is behavior, which I keep talking about, is not necessarily our purview, but the folks that are are the short-term rentals, behavior goes with them. What they leave behind for us to deal with, which is the septic situation, which is protecting the resource, it should be our primary uh, objective. Now, whether that's controlling over occupancy or whether it's controlling septic sizes that, that can be permitted, I think that is really a direction that needs to go, so. Thank you. All right, when's our next meeting date? Yeah, so I had some, dis I had had some discussion with our uh, county administrator as well as legal counsel. They were looking at bringing in a WCA representative, Dan Barr. Uh, also, it sounds like our legal counsel, Rebecca Roker, would like to make an in-person uh, appearance but that date would be preferred for Thursday, October 19th at 10 a.m. in this room. That would be one week earlier than the last Thursday of the month. Um, that would be my recommendation for our next meeting date as to what would be discussed in, in that meeting. It really probably just WCA update. The previous uh, discussion action item that was tabled, we'll put that back on there in case there's any additional information that's needed on that, but it should be a relatively shorter meeting um, unless there you know, was something that we were moving forward on at, at this point. But um, my recommendation would be the October 19th date at 10 a.m. here in the Sarah County uh, boardroom. Okay. All right. Do we need a motion on that? It'd be no, nice. You just said it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, then we are adjourned. Thank you. Good meeting, folks.